Hey everybody, how you doing? So there is something going on in the AI world that will have and does have a huge impact in terms of AI's viability, uh, how quickly AI will penetrate the market. It all comes down to the benchmarks. There's a big secret about the AI benchmarks that uh, a lot of the AI companies are not telling you about, but Apple kind of confirmed it with a recent study. And a good friend of mine who did a lot of research at one of the biggest AI companies in the world, he told me something about this as well. It's the AI benchmarks. The AI benchmarks that they use to show how much progress a particular model is uh, has made over previous models, they're gamed, in fact. They are gamed. They are not, in my estimation, a great measure at how good the AIs are. Not perfect. They have some in, they have some level of integrity, if you will, but it's misleading. So in a nutshell, you have these set benchmarks, these set tests that the AI industry utilizes to test to see how capable their particular model is. So GPT comes comes out, GPT-3 comes out, they test against these benchmarks. Then GPT-4 comes out, they test against these benchmarks and so on. Same thing with Gemini. They all use them. Standardized tests. Some tests are uh, mathematical in nature, some are visual in nature, so on and so forth. But what people don't talk about, well at least the AI industry doesn't talk about, is that what they do is that they train their AIs against these benchmarks. So they have these standardized tests and they and they when they're training the next version of the uh, of the AI of the large language model, they train it against the benchmarks specifically. So what does this mean? This means that over time, as they refine the models, as they refine the inputs that uh, allow the models to be trained, uh, they get more and more refined, more and more geared towards the particular benchmarks. But this does not necessarily indicate that the models universally are better. It just means that they've been uh, trained to be better at the benchmarks. And in fact, Apple, in a recent big study, uh, uh, they published this paper a few months ago, I did a video on it, they showed that to be the case with some really shocking pieces of data. So what did Apple do? Apple created their own benchmarks that mirrored, were kind of similar at the same level of difficulty as the traditional standardized benchmarks. And then they, what they did is they took all the models and they say, okay, Let's test you against these new benchmarks. And what they found is the models failed miserably, like miserably. Underperformed by a long shot, basically useless. So the conclusion is obvious. The AIs are not actually thinking. They don't think at all. They just remember pattern. They're giant pattern recognition systems. So does that mean that all the AIs are garbage and they're useless and they shouldn't be used? No, not at all. In fact, if you know anything about psychology, and you're lucky, uh, your Uncle Steph here, I know a little bit about psychology. That was my major in university, but I'm not a psychologist. But what you know, what you learn in psychology is that humans are giant pattern recognition uh, systems as well. We have the ability to do to deduce and to use logic, but we don't do it most of the time. That's what a lot of people don't understand. So the benchmarks are not they're not nefarious. I'm not suggesting that the AI companies are doing something uh, dishonest, wrong. Some people might say that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying is that this is the, the standard that has been established by the industry. Here are the benchmarks. So naturally, they're going to train their AI to do well on these benchmarks. But again, going back to that Apple study, and you just search it up, Apple study on AI, and they said AI doesn't think. AI doesn't think. It does not think. But again, as I said just recently, well, just uh, two minutes ago, we don't think either most of the time. I know this is stunning to you, but a cat doesn't realize then when they're scratching your couch, but they're not scratching a tree. For the cat, the couch and the tree are the same, right? Or the cat that takes a dump in your giant I don't know, flower pot doesn't realize that that's not the, uh, it's not the litter box, right? The cat doesn't have the capacity to understand the differences or the nuances of the differences, or the cat doesn't care. Well, it could be that the cat doesn't care. You know, cats, they don't care. 
Anyhow, but humans, we go through life and the study shows, this, all the studies show it over and over again. You can go look it up. Psych 101. That was my level in university. I did for like a year and a half, something like that, and then I dropped out. So humans don't think, right? Most of our perceptions of reality are based on a giant associative array. If you know anything about programming, you know what an associative array is. So it's a basically, it's a giant collection, a giant box of associations, you know? So it might be mouse, keyboard, keyboard, computer, uh, computer, mouse. And we make all these associations and then we start deducing reality based on these associations. So with the example I just gave, mouse, keyboard, keyboard, computer, monitor, uh, what does that tell us? We go, oh, that must be a computer. So we see a mouse, we think, oh, okay, it must be part of a computer. We see a keyboard, we go, oh, it must be part of a computer. And there's some logic to that. But we put that information together based on association and probabilities. That's what AI does. It's not logic like two plus two. That's why famously early AIs, early language models, they weren't able to uh, get simple math correct. So what they do, they were smart. The AI guys, well, our, our models can't think really. They have no capacity for logic. So what we do is we're gonna use Python. So if we have a math problem, what's behind the scenes, maybe use Python. So what they'll do is they'll drop into a programming language and then feed the information to the programming language and all that logic is hard coded in there so it gets an answer, so it's the AI and that thing, the AI just passing it off to a programming language to get the logical output that's accurate, and then it displays that to you. Anyway, I'm sure I'm getting some things wrong because I'm not an AI scientist. Bottom line is humans don't think most of the time. It's something we, we know. We make, associa make associations. Why do our brains make associations as opposed to thinking logically? Because logical thinking is very tiring. It's a lot of energy in that, whereas making associations is a shortcut. It works a lot of the times, by the way. But anyway, so there you go. So AIs don't think. Um, the models that show this progress is more about them training their AI to solve those models. It doesn't indicate that there's a progress in terms of their, for lack of better terms, in terms of the AI's ultimate cognitive capacity. So this tells me a few things about the job market. So the first thing it tells me that is that AGI, artificial general intelligence, is not around the corner. Now the AI vendors, maybe they think it, maybe they're just saying it for marketing purposes, I don't know, but it's not around the corner. So this has a huge implications in terms of the ultimate um, impact that AI will have on the job market. Don't get me wrong, AI is having an impact on the job market. We're starting to see the layoffs and the replacements, and we're starting to hear the stories. I have seen it myself. I talked about this a couple of times. I had a bug on a piece of software, old piece of legacy software. So I decided to debug it with the help of AI and to fix it. So AI uh, allowed me to read the log file, the server logs super quickly, allow me to get to answers. So instead of me going to Stack Overflow or going to Google or something, it was able to get the answers. So instead of me spending an hour and a half, two hours to solve the problem, it got it done in about five, 10 minutes. Now, I still needed to know what I was doing because some of the answers that the AI came back to me with were wrong. And I knew they were wrong because I'm an expert nerd. So I knew that the answers were wrong, so I was able to circumvent the limitations of the AI, but the AI is super powerful. You have to think of AI like a power tool. So if you're um, if you're if a carpenter and you're I don't know, you're building houses, you could saw the wood by hand, traditional, or you can use a power saw, get it done in just a few seconds. AI. What does this mean? This means you get the job done much more quickly, but you still need to know what you're doing, right? There's still a lot more to building a house, I would imagine, than just being able to cut a piece of wood. Same thing with writing software. Writing the code is just part of the process. So because AI uh, metrics and benchmarks are really game, gamed, if you will, not in a cheating way, but just in the sense where they train their models to solve those particular problems. But then as Apple showed, when they created their own set of benchmarks, the models all failed horribly. It tells you a lot. So they're not thinking. But that also instructs you in terms of how to leverage the AI in your own work, in your own business. 
So before uh, I continue, let me just say, I am not saying don't use AI. In fact, I'm saying as one of the OG uh, nerds out there started writing code in 94, web code in 94, I'm one of the original uh, nomadic, digital nomads, nomadic digital, digital nomads. I'm one of the original OG digital nomads. I know the game. And the key is to leverage new technologies. Don't make the mistake of following, following, falling in love with old technologies, the opportunities in the new. If you're younger, listening to this, or you're thinking of getting in the tech game, you're listening to this, whether you want to become an employee, a freelancer, or start a business, this, I think, is the beginning of the best opportunity since the web, if not even bigger. The reason I was able to leverage uh, the tech stack and, and do well is because it was new. I adopted the new stuff. When I first got out there building web apps for people, they were very simple web apps, but nonetheless, I would go into companies and a lot of them would say, what's a website? That's what they would say to me. What's a website? Or they would say to me, why do I need a website? Is this really useful? Bill Gates said that web, the web is just a fad. It's, it's going to disappear. The almighty Bill Gates... You know, so see, I don't know what Bill Gates, I don't know if Bill Gates was uh, saying that about the web and the internet because he believed that it was just a fad or because they were trying to protect Windows. You have to understand, you go back to the 1990s, a little nerd lore here, a little nerd history. In the 90s, Windows was super dominant. And the thinking out there was that Microsoft's so powerful that they have to be broken up, they're going to take over the world and... And that's it, it's over. We're all going to be slaves to Microsoft. Didn't happen. Remember lizard training I talk about for years now? Our brains are designed to overemphasize potential threats. It magnifies them artificially. So you hear all these threats like, oh, Microsoft's going to take over the world. Or Y2K. Y2K, oh my God. People were like building bomb shelters and loading up on guns and food. And people made a lot of money pushing that fear. Always be wary of that. There are people who will leverage fear and the potential of something to make a lot of money. And it happens every once in a while. Eh? So understanding how the benchmarks really work, what they really mean, they mean that the AI are getting incrementally better, marginally better. They're great at gathering information, making associations, but to, to leverage uh, a large language model, an AI, effectively, you have to really uh, focus the prompts. So I developed uh, an AI fitness coach. I call it Brad Fit. Uh, you can see the links below. So Brad Fit, the AI fit fitness coach, I trained over about four months, refining what it did and how it did things. And it works very, very good at what it does. And when I first started using GPT, I based it on GPT, because GPT has certain capabilities that Gemini doesn't have, Croc doesn't have, to my great surprise, and a Claude or a Claude, whatever you want, however you want to pronounce it, doesn't have. Uh, anyway, so GPT, GPT has this capability that was very good, but um, it would go off in all these crazy tangents. So I started training it over months, and it's quite refined now. It's quite capable now, but only within that context. You got to be careful. So. If you're watching this, you're thinking, hey, do I learn to code? Yeah, learn to code, but just learn the foundations. If you don't know what I'm talking about, links below. Doesn't take long. You can learn the foundations of the web stack, for example. So you learn HTML, HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript. I would learn also a little bit PHP, a little bit about databases. Not everything, just enough. See, a good course, a good teacher, a good mentor will teach you the things that you need to learn and not all the other stuff. This is way before AI, but it's even more crucial in the AI world. You see... Being able to memorize things is not super important. Being able, having credentials in the AI uh, game is not super important. Why? Well, being able to memorize things was not important for, for decades now. Why? Because we had Google, right? We had Stack Overflow. We had IDEs, Integrated Development Environments. If you forgot something about a particular language or a particular method or something or how a library worked, it was just like, and you got your answer. With, with AI, it's, it's 10 times quicker now. The people who are going to succeed are people who have a good, deep understanding of the fundamentals. So learn your fundamentals. 
So there you go. Because we see that the uh, the benchmarks are really game to a certain extent, they're not an indicator of progress towards artificial general intelligence. They're just an indicator of models being refined to solve particular problems. AI is not inventing anything new. They are just uh, pulling information that's already out there and they're putting it together uh, in a way that is based on their algorithms, based on associations and weighted associations. Very useful tool, but not perfect. Not, not Terminator level intelligence yet, but pretty dangerous if you don't, you don't want to put it in bots and killer bots in my opinion. But uh, generally speaking, it's good. It's good. You should learn it, leverage it. I think it's the biggest opportunity in the longest time, if not forever, for young entrepreneurs. Biggest opportunity. I think, to the contrary, AI is not a threat to individuals and small startups and freelancers. It's much more of a threat to large established organizations because the AI will very quickly, it already has, it takes away the advantages, the major advantage rather that the big corporation has, the big organization has, and that's the economies of scale. Now an individual or maybe a small team, a two or three, will be able to tackle uh, a particular business model or a particular uh, scope of work that prior to AI would take 200 people to do. So all of a sudden, you can have a nimble, driven, smart entrepreneur who organizes AIs and AI agents to do the work without the overhead and the cost and the bureaucracies that the large corporations are burdened with. So there you go. That's it. That's the story. I've gone off a few different tangents, but I hope this is useful for you. So if you're looking at this, you're listening to this, you're thinking, eh, do I learn programming? I'm 19. Yes. But don't learn it in the, the 2020 way. You got to learn it in the 2025 way, the AI way. And if you're older and you're thinking about it, why not? Why not? If you can, within uh, a year, skill up and become a master of AI, a user of AI who knows the different models, understands how to leverage them, knows how to create agents, understands MCP, understands AI first development, you're going to become super valuable no matter what industry you're in, whether you go into software development or strictly app development or whether you go work for an HVAC company and you start building systems for them, etc., and so on. All right, I'm Uncle Steph. I hope this is useful. If you like my content, uh, let me know in a comment below. Give me a thumbs up, you know. Um, last word of warning, and I'm just, I, just, I do this as a, uh, a community warning. Now Ruby is a language that um, people used to like. It got very popular in 2007, and I was warning against Ruby back then. So I wrote some applications in Ruby. I'm just saying... When I wrote the applications, I had a full head of hair, a Conan-level hair. It was fantastic, fantastic. In fact, uh, several women I knew disliked me for my hair. And then I wrote some Ruby. Next thing you know, what's going to happen? Later on, the hair started coming out. I, I don't have a causal relationship established here, but all I said, all I'm going to say, pre-Ruby, all my hair, post Ruby, no more hair. You decide.